So this is a nonlinear map of what I'm going to talk about. Nonlinear in the way that the space, the no space given on this slide does not correlate linearly to the time I'm going to spend on topics. But I will start with the convection 101, some basics, what's the Rayleigh number, what are boundary layers, what are scalings, why are they important. Then I will talk about mantle convection, point out the importance of rheology, not that Greg hasn't done that already. Talk about plates, lithosphere, stenosphere, both in the oceanic and the continental setting. Um, then I will move to the lithosphere, stenosphere boundary and interactions at this boundary, um, how this boundary has been imaged successfully, gravitational instabilities that occur, small scale convection, drips, delamination events. I will talk about plate rotting forces and then I will give a quick wild ride on my own recent work. Um, and in the beginning, when Barbara introduced the CIDR program, she mentioned that uh, a couple of decades ago, the concept of plate tectonics has been widely accepted. And I know many people in this room haven't been born at that time, but I want to point out that even now, 40 years or so after it has been recognized, there are still first order things that you can um, work on and figure out. And then I'm showing some of my own stuff uh, to point it out for the students. So convection, I always like to start with the definition, is basically fluid motion due to density differences in a gravity field. Um, so we have fluid, and that can really be anything. And I apologize for the, for the, so this is supposed to be right about fluid, but as everybody knows now, there was an asteroid hitting, almost hitting Earth the other day, and so they messed up things in the PowerPoint. Um, so fluid is anything, water, air, as geologists we know, who wait long enough and um, are patient enough and wait millions or billions of years, we see that rock can flow as well, if the appropriate stresses are applied. Motion implies that there's a velocity involved, something is moving, something is translating, uh, you know, a piece of fluid is moving. Density differences uh, due to temperature is probably the most common one. There's also composition involved, or you can potentially think of other things that influence the density. And gravity field, that will depend on your planet. If you go outside Earth, you think of Mars or Moon, much smaller gravity. If you think of super-Earths, which are kind of uh, of interest in these days, gravity would be much different. And plate tectonics might be very different as well on those things. Convection general is one of the three heat transport mechanisms that we know. There's also conduction and radiation. Um, and con convection really is a combination of both advection and conduction. So if you think of any given fluid parcel, there's two ways of moving heat about. There's the option of having the, of this fluid parcel having a, some heat, some extra heat that you then translate along to a different location. That would be advection, the translation of heat. Conduction, on the other hand, you think of this fluid parcel staying put in place where it is and heat just slowly diffusing out. So that's the diffusive component. And uh, convection is really both of these together. The fluid motions of convection are described by conservation equations, and Dave touched on this earlier this week. Um, in the mantle convection business, we frequently use the Boussinesque approximation for mantle convection. And all that really means is that, uh, on, a, on a very fundamental level, we assume that the density of our material is constant, except where it drives convection. Um, so the conservation of mass, uh, we're really dealing with an incompressible fluid, so the density is constant. Um, I have to use part of my pointer now. Um, so really, if you, that didn't work. So if you think about uh, having density, you know, change with time, how can it change? you'll see, you'll have something like this. So the change in density in your material has to come either by making or creating something or by moving it about. And when you then assume that density is a constant, well, then you drop this term and you drop this term and uh, you're left with this, so this velocity. So that, that basically is the, we call it the incompress incompressibility uh, constraint. It looks like this. Conservation of energy, so we deal with temperature, so the, the change in temperature um, is due to an advective term, so you move temperature, you move heat about by translating uh, fluid parcels or by diffusing it. And finally, the conservation of momentum, so you have uh, pressure gradients that are balanced by, by viscous stresses, so this is the stress tensor basically, um, and then here's the driving force, uh, this is the direction of gravity, temperature, and the Rayleigh number. And I will talk to about the Rayleigh number in a moment. But uh, for now, just note that in all of this, there's the, you know, what we call the primitive variables, the ones that we're solving for uh, temperature, velocity, and so forth. And there's one real free parameter. Um, 
and that's kind of neat. And I will talk about that on the next slide. Um, the, the most fundamental convection cell um, has been realized uh, in the beginning of the century, I believe, um, with Lord Rayleigh, and, and this is sort of the Rayleigh Bernard setup. Basically, you have a, a, a very long, a very wide fluid layer that you heat from below and you cool from above. And in the, in the very basic conception, the fluid inside this, this, this layer is, um, doesn't depend on anything else, doesn't depend on temperature, the, the properties are all constant. So what you then get is you get a, a cold thermal boundary layer, right? You're cooling from above, and this will, this will move about and eventually become unstable and start to sink. So you have this cold sinking current. Material will pool up at the base, it will heat up, and eventually become unstable and rise. So there's a hot rising current on this side. And so this, this guy here is what we call a convection cell. Um, and and uh, that's kind of a, the, the most basic thing of convection. You will note that so while this is the cold part of the convection cell and this is the warm part of the convection cell, the interior is rather iso isothermal. So the temperature in there doesn't change very much. So I talked about the Rayleigh number. And what the Rayleigh number is, it's basically uh, it's a dimensionless parameter. Um, and so it's the, it's the ratio basically of driving forces to resisting forces. So in here we have gravity, we have density differences. So there's the reference density, thermal expansion coefficient, and then temperature changes. We have the, the height of the box or the, or the depth of the fluid layer cubed. So this is important. Keep that in mind. That's important. Resisting fluid motion is uh, of viscous stresses and, and uh, thermal diffusion. Uh, just so we keep it in mind, I'll, I'll write the Rayleigh number down once more. So when the slide disappears, our, our concept of the Rayleigh number maybe not. Maybe it stays around for a bit. Okay. So I've said it's a dimensionless parameter. And, and really what that means, it, uh, I know, what, what it means is that if you have a system, say you have a computer experiment, or you have a lab tank, a fish tank, you have a pool, or you look at the ocean or mantle, um, whenever you hit the, these dimensional parameters right, you get the same behavior. And that's, that's the, the, the fundamental success in, in us applying these computer models to, to planetary scales or to micro scales and working on, in the lab and theory, computer, and, or on Earth at the same time. The Rayleigh number itself indicates the vigor of convection. You might have heard this before. Um, there's something that we call the critical Rayleigh number. And if you, you know, however, however you set up your system, so you can, you can change a number of things. But the ultimately important is what's, what's the ratio of this? What's the final, the final number? If that number is below 1,000, and this depends on the boundary conditions, but um, for simplicity, let's say it's an order of 3, um, 10, to the, 10 to the 3. So if it's below that, you will not see convective motion. Heat will just be transported through this fluid layer via conduction. If, however, you get your parameters right and you go above this critical value, you will see the onset of convection. You will see these warm currents rising up and these cold currents sinking down. And one of the, one of the things you can look at, and many people do, is the, is the surface heat flux. So how much heat do I get out of the system um, by, by applying those things? And so you, you would look at the total heat flux out of the system at the surface. And you would divide that by, you, you would normalize everything. You want to divide it by the conductive heat flux that, would, that you would have in the absence of convection. And this quantity we call the Nusselt number, um, NU. And if you plot the Nusselt number versus this uh, Rayleigh number or the critical Rayleigh number, you see that if you're below the critical Rayleigh number, the Nusselt number is 1 because you just get convection out of the system. But then once you're above this Rayleigh number, the Nusselt number will increase and that indicates that you're in a convective system. Let me talk about boundary layers. Um, I think one, of, one good definition of boundary layers is that it is the transitional area between two regions with different physical properties. And these properties really can be anything. Um, even most commonly in our, in our world, we use the uh, thermal boundary layer, so there are temperature differences between, between two regions of the fluid. But you can also think of boundary layers in terms of velocity boundary layers or mechanical or rheolog rheological boundary layers. Shown here on the left is a convection cell. Um, and in the, in the remainder of my talk, I'll try to keep the color scale that red indicates warm and blue indicates cold and green, yellow, kind of in between. Um, so here's the cold upper boundary layer and then the sinking current, the warm lower boundary layer and the rising current. And these lines are just ISO, ISO lines so you can sort of get a feel on where these guys are. Um, if the color scale gets messed up. So you see, as I, as I indicated before in the schematic, that the interior, the bulk of the 
fluid stays at a constant temperature. That's roughly the average temperature. And what we do in, in fluid dynamics quite a bit is we look at, you know, we, we always like to look at all the information we have, but that gets um, overwhelming at times. And so we like to um, reduce the, the amount of information we look at. And one rather useful thing to do is to take horizontal averages. So imagine I take this, I take this information and average from here to here at each depth. So here I see in the middle, for example, most of this would be one half, um, the middle temperature, and then this guy and this guy would probably cancel out. Um, however, if you're up here, this is all cold and this is all warm. So expect some kind of a gradient from, from uh, cold over middle to warm. And if you do this, you see, you see it goes like this. So this is the, the top surface, this is cold. This is the bottom surface, this is warm. Um, so that's good. We see that the bulk of the interior is constant temperature. And we see that most of the heat differences are absorbed within these regions here. And this is what we call the boundary layer. And we can we don't it with delta. And this is really where, where, the, where the action happens. Um, so that's kind of important. You will see that the, this boundary layer is symmetric because we have applied symmetric heating and cooling. Um, there are other ways of, of getting not symmetric. Um, I will talk about it in a moment. So this thickness of the boundary layer um, depends critically on the Rayleigh number. Um, and you see two images here. This one is for a slightly higher Rayleigh, lower Rayleigh number. This one is for a slightly higher Rayleigh number. And you can see, if you, you know, squeeze your eyes, you can see this very well. So the boundary layer here is about this, about this scale. The boundary layer here is much reduced, so it's much thinner. And the scaling, and you can go to textbook and look up how to derive this. I'm not going to do it here. The scaling would be delta is proportional to, uh, to Rayleigh to the one-third, minus one-third. So delta is proportional to Rayleigh over minus one-third. Which one? I think I do. Thanks for catching that. Um, that's that's top heated, and you know at the same time you just have to change gravity around. It's the same again. Um, so I talked about that the the system when you have heating from below, cooling from above, you get a symmetric uh, temperature profile where these boundary layers are the same the same thickness and where they both absorb the same amount of temperature drop. You can break the symmetry if you like. Um, and you know, why am I saying this? Um, obviously, I'm going to move from basic convection to mental convection. And we know inside planetary interiors, we have quite a significant amount of internal heating. So what happens if you apply internal heating to the system? Um, basically, what you do is you change the bulk average temperature. So you, you move this guy over here. And what you do at the same time is you increase the temperature drop at the surface and you do decrease the temperature drop at the base. Another way of breaking the symmetry is by introducing a non-constant material parameter. One of the more important ones is viscosity. So think that the, the viscosity of your material depends on temperature. And what this does is it creates a very strong lid um, at, the, at the surface. And if you think about what I, what I wrote on here, and I can't remember if I should use black or blue at this point. Um, so th the boundary layer thickness depends on the Rayleigh number to, to the minus one third. So if, so if I'm at the surface, so the temperature is, is cold, so the temperature would go down. Um, we know the Rayleigh number, we know the viscosity is temperature dependent, so the viscosity goes up. If the viscosity goes up, we know the Rayleigh number will go down. And if we know the Rayleigh number goes down, we know the boundary layer thickness goes up. So, so that it's good that it kind of makes sense. Um, so it's good to check if the things you're doing make sense. Um, scalings from boundary layer theory. I gave it the subtitle to understand and predict. Um, there, it's quite useful to come up with a number of, of uh, you know, very simple scaling relations like the ones on the board to check your intuition and, and see if, if you try to figure out if what you're seeing makes sense physically. Shown here is a, is a scaling from boundary layer theory that assumes the half space cooling model. You've probably heard about this. Um, if not, what this allows you to do is to, to see what the temperature will look like as a function of depth and time, say in a, in a lithospheric plate. Uh, where would the isotherms be once the, once the material moves away from the mid-ocean ridge? And shown here is a, a classic example. So this would be depth, this would be time, and you see these uh, square root of h um, functions for, for different temperatures, what, you know, the way your isosomes would, isosomes would look like. You can do the same thing with surface heat flow, and, and you still, still see the square root of H dependence. And where this gets interesting is, if you look at the, 
the change in the seafloor depth with age, and people have done this you know, many years before, and you see the, in the thick black, black dots here, there's a data observed, um, some uncertainties plotted as well, and you see for the first maybe 70 or 80 million, year, million years, um, the data is very well explained by the half space cooling model, so just by this guy basically. Um, and then at you know, older ages, there's deviations, and people try to explain these with different models. These are plate model for those ages. Um, but it, I think you know, to first order, it's exciting that I think this, this was uh, one of the things that, that allowed for plate tectonics to be accepted is that you know, the, the first order features can very well be explained by simple scaling theory, boundary layers. Um, to the right is a color plot from uh, Peter Bird, and he's uh, combining both these, these uh, scalings with real data of heat flow to trying to create a map on where you know, a heat flow map on the Earth. And you see that heat flow is uh, obviously mostly uh, dominant at the ridge systems. And then further away, things get a little colder. What's the scale on that? It's hard to see. This is uh, 0.3 watts per meter squared. Um, that's 0.08. Um, I think it's highly skewed to show um, things away from the ridges. So now that I've talked about the Rayleigh number, let's forget about it again quickly. Um, maybe not completely. Why am I saying this? If you, if you are in the mental convection business, the first thing any reviewer will ask you is, are you at the right Rayleigh number? And if you were in the, in the mental convection business, the first answer should be, why would I care? Um, obviously, I've said before, if you hit the right Rayleigh number, you are in the right ballpark, and you can trust that the convection you're simulating is the convection you would expect in the Earth. But the Rayleigh number is just one out of several input parameters. And so maybe because the system is so complex and we're throwing in um, different rheologies and different assumptions, maybe it's not so important to look at the input parameters of your simulations. Maybe it is more important to compare the output parameters. And those you can compare with observable, observables that we have. And so the, the classical candidates there would be the surface heat flux, which we can measure. Um, and so non-dimensionalized is the Nusselt number. For Earth, we'd expect a value of about 20. Or you might want to compare with surface velocities, plate velocities. And uh, so you want to shoot for a target of maybe 10 to the 4, which in dimensional units would be about a centimeter per year. Or you might want to look at the boundary layer thickness of your model and see if you get into a range of 70 or 100 kilometers. Uh, you can look at the topography on geos as well. But the point being is that the Rayleigh number is just one input parameter. Um, and there, there are other things that go into these models, um, at least in the sophisticated modern models. Um, and so people think about deep piles or continents. So the composition of material is important. The viscosity, as, as mentioned before, is important. Yield stress is important. When will I, at which stresses will I allow my material to break, to fail, um, and, to, and to change its behavior? So don't focus too much on the Rayleigh number alone. And Rayleigh is important. Greg gave a great uh, talk and tutorial yesterday afternoon, so I don't have to repeat anything. You're probably still very intimately familiar with this equation and with why rheology is an important concept. Once the radial viscosity structure in the uh, mantle is not uniform and it varies by orders of magnitude, how, how do we pick the viscosity to even define a Rayleigh number? So this is uh, you know, it's immediate how much we rely on Rayleigh number and yet how much we don't know how to really describe it in a way. Right. So that's a very good question. And I, um, I run to this a lot. So there are basically what, what Dave is saying is Things are more complicated than just quoting one number and running with it. So what he's saying is the Rayleigh number, I think he's talk, he was talking in blue, I think. So he was saying the, you know, the temperature, the viscosity depends, depends with temperature. So if I change this guy around um, for different temperatures, then this varies, so this will vary. Um, so what, what am I quoting now? I'm quoting the Rayleigh number at the surface. So if I have my fluid layer here, um, so the surface is cold and the, the, base, the base is hot. So then my viscosity would depend on temperature. So I would have a high viscosity here. And I would have a low viscosity here. And uh, so basically, I, I'm allowed to define two different Rayleigh numbers. Um, or I could say, well, maybe I'll just take the average viscosity and I put it in here. Um, but then in the, in the systems, and you will see examples towards the end of the talk, it's not a priori clear what the, ref, what the absolute viscosity will be at the end of the game. So you can't say, you know, what's my Rayleigh number a priori? And so, so some people, um, rather than quoting the Rayleigh number a priori, they, they, 
try to figure out what's the eventual viscosity profile, then take either the interior or the average viscosity, put this back in here and say, so this is the effective rate number I have. So it's not, it's not as easy a game as it, as it maybe looks on first glance. So thanks for pointing that out. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions that um, we still kind of have in the mental convection game is how do you make plates from mental convection? If you read, if you read papers or, or many textbooks, you will come across a phrase um, that kind of goes like this. Plate tectonics is the surface manifestation of mental convection. And it's, it's great because I think it's true, but it's, um, it's also true that we probably don't exactly know how that surface, surface manifestation comes about. So how do you make plates from mental convection? Well, I think one of the major ingredients is uh, having a strongly temperature dependent viscosity to get that thick and, and mechanically strong lid um, on your surface. Then if you have that strong lid, you also need to find a way to break it. You need to have um, some mechanism that, that allows for failure, for yielding at sufficiently high stresses. Um, you might want to argue that you, you want to have a weakening mechanism because you think maybe your convective stresses aren't high enough on Earth. And uh, I think there's been some talk about over the last couple of days um, mentioning these so you can have a rheology that depends on, on faults, or your faults behave differently. Um, there's history dependence, there's potential of water. A personal bias, I think, in a student's view might be kind of important to have plate tectonics. Um, we can come to that. So if the oceanic lithosphere is our upper thermal or mechanical boundary layer, does it make it a plate already? Um, well, the first order it probably does. And shown here is a, it's an image sort of showing the mid-ocean ridge process. So this is a stenosphere and it slowly gets converted to oceanic lithosphere, which then cools and, and thickens as it spreads away from the ridge. So that's probably a first order, not a bad assumption. Um, it leaves the question, if that's the case, if that's the lithosphere, then what is the asthenosphere? Um, and that points to the question, as, uh, as Dave has hinted at, what's the viscosity structure of Earth's interior as well? So the oceanic lithosphere, what makes this lithosphere plate-like um, and, and most people feel that one good measure of having a plate-like lithosphere is one that moves coherently. That, so there's a, a strong plate that translates as a relatively coherent layer. And the question then becomes, you know, how do you define coherent? And there's an early paper that tries to quantify the level of coher coherence. Um, shown here, where, so this is the length of your convection cell. Shown here are surface velocities normalized by interior velocities for three different cases. The blue case, um, they call it frozen, now we would call it stagnant lid convection, is where basically you have a stagnant lid on your planet and, and the surface does not move, so it's zero. Um, and our convection is constrained, confined to the material below. In red is, um, is what we call mobile lid convection. Here you see you have uh, parts of your surface moving to the right, so that's the positive velocities, other parts moving to the left, those would be negative velocities. And really deformation between those plate-like things or s occurs in wide ranges um, between those, between those uh, things. And there's even deformation within where, where pieces of your, of your surface layer moves at different velocities. And then the, the, the best, you know, best plate-like motion you can imagine is outlined in green where you have coherent chunks of material moving one way, coherent chunks of material moving the other way, and where boundaries are very narrow and confined. And that's what we believe is, is most likely what our Earth looks like. Um, a word of caution when we talk about words like lithosphere and asthenosphere and boundary layer. Um, oh, you always want to make sure you the name tag we're talking to and try to figure out what the discipline is because everybody uses different the same word for different concepts and it might be worth uh, spending a minute or so on, on, on trying to figure out you know, what does this person mean with the word asthenosphere? What does this person mean with the word lithosphere? And so there's, there's different ways of defining it. One is temperature, and I touched on this before. So um, this is the temperature gradient. Um, so this is the conductive lid, and then you get the adiabatic below. You get some kind of a transition zone. And you may want to define this part here, where you get the temperature drop as your thermal boundary layer. At the same time, it's equally valid to define your, your boundary layer as a mechanical boundary layer, maybe based on the strain rate. And so there's a typical, typical profile of the strain rate um, of such a system. So you would have you know, your coherent chunk that, that doesn't internally deform, um, you could define that as your mechanical boundary layer um, that translates coherently. And then this is where the deformation happens. You might want to throw in your lithosphere, stenosphere boundary uh, definition right there. If you talk to seismologists, they might want to talk about seismic velocities. So, so think about the shear velocity, 
um, there's a high viscosity lid and wherever that gets reduced in one of these steps you can come up with a definition for the LAB. Um, it might be a little bit more clear if you think of in terms of anisotropy um, as, as different flow patterns change the fabric um, and you might get a, a clearer image here. There are also people who do electric conductivity studies or inversely resistivity studies and they find that the lithosphere can be associated with a resistive lid and then where this resistance diminishes is what they might call the Stevens sphere. And this diagram is even optimistic about how well they line up. Yeah. <laughs> So under, under oceans, the students here has been um, imaged very well, and uh, I'm, I'm probably at, fault, at the same fault as everybody else by trying to confuse the, the LVZ, the, the zone of so low seismic velocity, with the low viscosity zone, which also may be LVZ or, or L eta Z, to keep them separate. But um, what people have done is they've, they've produced images uh, of where, they, where they plot depth versus age of, of, the, of the material below the plate and then plot uh, in, in color coded what the shear by velocities are. And this convincingly, to me at least, uh, suggests that there's um, some layer between maybe 100 and 200 kilometers depth that is different from, from the rest. It has a lower seismic velocity, maybe because there's a lower um, viscosity, or really what causes the asthenosphere. Um, well, I can tell you right now, I won't, I won't tell you the answer. Um, and honestly, I don't know the answer. But there are a couple of candidates out there, and some of them look more promising than others. And I will try to touch on all of them. Um, one explanation for the low zone in, in seismic shear wave velocity is that it, it could be just due to uh, some solid state analytic effects. And so this, this would suggest that uh, I do tilt this, I do move this around to make depth go downwards. Um, so the shear wave velocity re is reduced sort of naturally by analytic effects in a, in a region below maybe one or 200 kilometers for Pacific uh, ages. So maybe that's a good candidate to start with. Um, another, another one has been proposed recently, um, maybe not that recently, looking at the time, um, that dehydration at the mid-ocean ridge might create, might set up a viscosity stratification. So the material that's created at the mid-ocean ridge that becomes the lithosphere is more dehydrated, and by that it has a different strength. It's stronger than the material below that retains the water. And so you effectively set up a viscosity stratification with a dry surface and, a, and maybe a, a dry and a strong surface and maybe a wet and a weaker material below. Then for a long time, um, partial melt has been invoked and it's, it's kind of falling in and out of favor as time goes by and graduate students um, get jobs and everything. Um, so the shown here is a, is a geotherm. So this is pressure or depth either way versus temperature. You see this is where the temperature drop occurs. Um, Here's the adiabatic component. And plotted in red is the solidus. And you would expect wherever this, this region where the solidus and the geotherm inter intersect, this is a region where you can expect some amount of partial melt, which then potentially can influence viscosities or seismic velocities. This gets even more interesting when you consider how hydrous melt changes the solidus. So shown here is the reduction in the solidus. Um, this is the dry solidus. And then the more water you add, the further you move to the left. So you more, you further, the further you move to lower temperatures. Um, so you could expect even more, even more partial melt. More recently, um, the, the concept of carbonatite melt has been introduced. And shown here are the same. This is the same figure, uh, different colors from Fusli and, uh, et al. And this is another one. Um, and on top of these images of, of shear wave velocity are, uh, are drawn um, patches of uh, calculated melt distribution and, uh, and while this doesn't prove that there's a causal relation, I think it's still highly suggestive that maybe the presence of, of uh, carbon might introduce some melting as well. So under the oceans, the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, and therefore the boundary of lithosphere and asthenosphere, has been observed seismically by several groups. Um, the same has more recently been done under continents, shown here is a cross-section through North America. And rather than at, uh, at about 100 kilometers here, the boundary between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere has been mapped out at about 200 kilometers. Um, so this is all very successful. Another interaction of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary is obviously the destruction of the lithosphere. Um, and a review paper by, by Sinti um, you know, provides me with a nice figure of several mechanisms that might aid on removing these. We've talked a little bit about uh, delamination events yesterday, and I, I want to keep it short here. But so there are, there are different ways you can envision how you can get rid of your continent lithosphere. So you can you know, have drips that form. You can start eroding things. 
Um, you, can, you can provide high stresses that will, will shave things off the base. You can get some high, uh, hydrological weakening effects. Um, or you can drive things by the edge or, or do more complicated things. So there are different ways of interacting with the um, lithosphere, if you were the stenosphere. Um, one, one example of, uh, of observation of the elimination of the continental lithosphere in the Colorado Plateau has recently been published. And there are members in this audience who can speak about this with much more authority. So I will let them do that at the given time. Um, I want to point out here again, this is the same picture I showed before. So this is the half space cooling model that nicely explains how, at least for the first 70 or so million years, the, the change in bathymetry is well explained by the, by the simple half space cooling model. People have tried to uh, use numerical simulations to, to get at this change. Why does it deviate here? And one example has been small scale convection, another mechanism of this, of the interaction between the stenosphere and lithosphere. So the expectation here is that as, you, if, as your thermal boundary layer thickens, at some point it will become unstable and produce these little droplets, these instabilities that will effectively remove cold material from the surface and keep its thickness constrained. And so you can see um, people are very well able now to mimic this trend um, in numerical simulations. One of the things you want to have is a, is a strong temperature dependence in viscosity. So you get this high lead and you just get those droplets. Yeah. More recently, people have mapped this out in 3D and they're, they're trying to, to uh, create these, uh, these instabilities and relate them to melt, melt portions and then try to explain non-spot <coughs> volcano chains in the Pacific. So this is, uh, this is all something that's been done recently. So for graded students, plate tectonics well, might be old, but it's still quite alive. Um, it's old, uh, as I said, and this is from 75, probably before many of you were born. Um, this is a, an image of a slab going down and you have the ridges here. So this is basically your, your plate tectonic system. And plotted there are all the forces people can, can come up with that might be driving or resisting plate motion. And from early on, it has been recognized that slab pull is probably the dominant driving force because you have these, these thick, negatively buoyant pieces of, of lithosphere that would like to do nothing more than just descend into the um, low viscous and warm material mantle. And by that, you know, they'd like to pull along whatever they've attached on the surface. Um, so here. So that's probably the, the, the most dominant plate driving force, um, both, uh, both in, in Earth and also in literature. Um, but other things have been proposed and might be more or less reasonable. Um, what I'd like to point out here is that, so while, while the dominant plate driving force is, is maybe slab pull, the dominant resisting force is usually considered to be viscous dissipation. So the material, um, so the, the force balanced um, is due to viscous dissipation. Um, here, a more recent study that tries to look at the combination of slab pull and slab suction. So slab pull is, you have this really big old slab that descends and pulls everything along. Slab suction is the concept that while it does this, it creates a low pressure zone, which then allows for more material to follow. And it's the combination of both, of slab pull and slab suction, that can explain observed plate velocities rather well. And shown here's a, um, observed plate velocities and surface velocities from these models um, with a focus on Pacific plate. And you can see a, a pretty good match, I believe. Um, more recently, there's been more thoughts on plate driving forces, and this particular one for the continental setting. And it turns out that you can explain protected continental collisions very well by basal tractions. And basal tractions are, are these kind of things. This is from, from Basil Ticker, who I believe will be in the audience next week. Um, he turned it clutch tectonics. And uh, so he tries to identify different, different conceptually different uh, ways to, between the lithosphere and the stenosphere to move and to behave. So the lithosphere can lead the stenosphere um, and provide this shear that, that everybody believes is, should be in the stenosphere. Or the system could be bottom driven. So the stenosphere might be leading the lithosphere. And potentially you, you can have uh, um, different fabric alignment, different fabric development that you hopefully can, can image seismically and then try to constrain which of these mechanisms is at work. In this notion, I'm, I'm starting to show my own work a little bit. Shown here are two simulations of mantle convection flow. Um, in color, again, temperature, these are isosurfaces. Um, so you can see into the box. So this is a box uh, four times the height, both in this way and into the board. This is a box 10 times the box height. 
both along the board and into the board. The bottom panels are just a front surface view of the temperature and plotted on top here are velocity profiles. So this dashed line is the zero, pro the zero velocity line. Everything that's to the right moves to the right. Everything that's to the left moves to the left. So here's, you see the return flow here basically. And you can see the, the upper mantle flow here. What's interesting about these two examples is that this one clearly shows the zone of low viscosity that I put in. So you see the strong parabolic flow within the asthenosphere below the, the strong lid. In this example, you don't see this so much. You see more a, a linear flow profile in the asthenosphere. And so it turns out for, the, for all the simulations I've done, you can always see what the average flow profile looks like in the asthenosphere. And it will always be a combination of this pressure-driven flow, this parabolic flow type, and this linear fro flow profile, the, the Kuwait flow type. And so I thought it might be interesting to sort of figure out what the difference is, or what the ratio is, and what the ratio depends on. And I will come to that in a moment. And more recent work by Clint Conrad's group and his, his student um, tries to model based on to today's plates configurations and um, today's uh, flow pattern inside the Earth's mantle what this percentage of post soil flow would be in the asthenosphere. And uh, supporting my, my own work, they find that near the ridges, you get a higher concentration of post soil flow. And far away from the ridges, you get more of this quite flow. So it goes along with the one I've showed you earlier, that for short systems, you get more of the pressure-driven flow. And for long systems, you get more quite flow. So short systems would be um, you know, either a short convection cell in the model, or if you go to Earth, it would be a, a small plate, like the Atlantic plate as a short aspect ratio. And a long cell would be the Pacific plate, for example, which is a long aspect ratio. Uh, I've tried to define this, but I probably glanced over it. So the soil flow is here, the pressure-driven flow component um, of your flow. So it's the parabolic components for soil flow, and the linear component is quite flow. On the next slide, how is that constrained? Is that a model? This is, this is a model. This is, um, um, so what they're doing is they're taking, I believe, a seismic tomography model, and I can't remember which one, and uh, map the uh, wave velocities into temperature differences, and uh, that into density differences and let instantaneously let these gravity differences drive surface flow and flow in the interior. And then they map out um, where they see linear contributions and parabolic contributions. So apart from that is what they define for the viscosity of the atmosphere. Right, right. And this is just one of the many models that they make. And this is, up to, oh, I should also say, this is work in process and progress. And um, so I don't think they're yet uh, ready to write it up yet. But it's, it's good work and, and Conrad's students um, is, uh, is very excited about this work. So I wanted to show it. So now I'm changing the color scale on you. So everything you've seen so far, except the very last slide, has been published. So there was black on white, and you can read up on that. And everything that's going to follow is unpublished, and it's either in, in review or um, still in my head. Um, so that's going to be white and black, just so you see the difference uh, in maybe trustworthiness or however you want to define it. Um, I, st I start off with the simple model of the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. Um, so think about a two-layer system. There's the lithospheric plate has a certain viscosity. The asthenosphere below has a different viscosity. Um, so this guy here is, you know, whatever coherent is moves at some, at some coherent velocity and is pulled by some large-scale convective process. So think of me sitting here pulling on the big slab. The asthenosphere, on the other hand, has a low viscosity and I allow for, very, for, for different flow types in here. So I don't prescribe those. It could be either wet flow type, or it could be prosoical flow type, or it could be a combination of those. Um, if you look at this insert here, and I've magnified this here, and you were to plot isosurfaces temperature, so isotherms, then you can see that this, uh, this change in depth sets up a lateral gradient in temperature. And I will show you in a moment how I map this lateral te temperature gradient into density gradients, into pressure gradients, and, and how that can drive flow. So if you do that, you see, uh, so this is, the, again, the ratio of post soil flow types of the pressure-driven component to the shear-driven component. Um, and the prediction is that it will be linear in the log-log plot. So this is the aspect ratio. This is the length of the, of the box. Shown here, the points are from my simulations. Shown the, in the solid line is the prediction from the simple theory. And uh, I, find, I find this uh, surprisingly agreeable. Um, the, other, the other lines are for different assumptions on convective style that is not appropriate to the simulations, but can be used to predict flows in other, in other areas. So this is the simple equation that, that uh, 
connects the flow in the sinusphere, the velocity, to the plate velocity. And you see the Rayleigh number goes in here again, and this aspect ratio to the minus one third. The Rayleigh number here is the Rayleigh number defined sort of with asthenosphere values in mind, so rather than having um, the, the entire thickness of the layer, I now use the thickness of the asthenosphere. I use these temperature gradients in the asthenosphere and the asthenosphere viscosity. And how do I get at the temperature gradients? Um, that'd be a good question for someone to ask me now. Um, so, so what I did, but because I can't guess those, right? I can't see that, I can't, I can't measure it. But people can measure seismic velocities, and I have. And I find that um, seismic velocities in the asthenosphere region sh varies with, with age of the overriding plate. And so what this age bind shear wave velocity gives you, if you think of age in terms of distance, because you know the plate velocity, it gives you a shear wave gradient spatially. And if you then assume that differences in shear wave velocities are only due to temperature, then suddenly you have a temperature gradient. And a temperature gradient is exactly what I need, and I can map this to density gradients and pressure gradients. Um, and if I do that, um, I can plot the, the model of the velocity in the sinusphere, say I need the Pacific, for different assumptions of the sinusphere thickness and the viscosity. And say if I assume the sinusphere is about 70 kilometers thick, and the viscosity might be maybe 10 to the 19 Pascal seconds, then I get a value of about 7 centimeters per year. And you, you can move about this field and see, pick your preferred values. If you do this for the asthenosphere, you get values of 50 centimeters per year. So this is an order of magnitude more. And at this point, it doesn't matter which particular point I choose, because the ratio of these values will always be this, this order of magnitude or so. And what this suggests is that the Pacific, the, the, underneath the Pacific, the asthenosphere goes at about 7 centimeters per year. And we know the Pacific plate is faster. It's about maybe on average 10 centimeters per year. So this is your classical scenario, the classical plate tectonic system with a strong plate that is a big old slab that's pulling on it and that's moving the plate. And the asthenosphere is at best sheared below. A very different picture emerges for the Atlantic system where we know there's no big slab pulling on it. We know the surface velocities are rather low at maybe about a centimeter per year. And where we predict the asthenosphere to be much faster. Um, more than order of magnitude faster. So potentially the sinusphere here will not only lead the plate, but it can, through viscous coupling at this interface, can pull the plate along and provide a plate driving force where many people have seen a plate resisting force um, before. This is particularly important for small plates, so for short aspect ratios. So Atlantic plates is a, is a good example for strong plate margins. And you may be able to come up with other um, areas where this is important or where this is not important. Um, yeah. Is it important how uh, what the viscosity of the sinusphere is? Is the coupling of the drag to the one? Yes, it is. It is. So what, what David is asking is a very good question. So the shear stress is proportional to viscosity um, and then a velocity gradient. Right, and that's exactly what I have here. So I have this um, this flow type, I mean, and I'm arguing that here I have a strong velocity gradient. And what Dave is saying, well, hold on, it doesn't, isn't this important? Um, shouldn't I have a low viscosity zone in here? And if a low viscosity, shouldn't that lower my shear stress? And the answer is yes, it should, and it does. Um, and, and that's why everybody thought this is not going to be a, not going to be important. But it turns out that with the estimates I've done, is that the gradient in, in velocity outweighs the, the, the small amount in, in, the, in the viscosity difference. Um, and I'm happy to show you, you know, a, a paper that I've written up where I'm trying to estimate under which conditions this is, this is a plate driving force and when, when, do th when does this break down. But it's important to, to consider. Yes? I'm curious in the landing, if you see the sphere moving so fast, where is it going? That's a very good question. I don't know. There's a, I don't have this plot now. There's a paper by Eaton in 2007, I believe, and he's seeing... Um, oh, there maybe maybe two answers to this. Well, one of them, he sees... Um, volcanic chains that run from the Atlantic into North America. And it could be that they're produced by the Atlantic flow that, that tries to penetrate into, into it. Another one is, I don't know where it's going, but if you, if you sort of do these numbers and you try to estimate what's the stress contribution of the Atlantic asthenosphere onto the North American continent, you come up with values of about maybe two or three megapascals. So it's, it's, it's in the ballpark of where it, it might potentially be reasonable to have a seismic deformation and yet still provide a pressure constraint or a you know, constraint onto the North American continent to keep it into in the um, in the stress balance that we try that we think we're seeing. So is it flowing west? Or east? It's flowing uh, 
both ways, it's going away from the ridge. So it's the one. If this is this is the ridge, this is Africa and Europe. And at this point, you can see I'm not a geologist, so I, can't, I don't know what they really look like. Um, this is North America, um, so I, you know they're they be going this way. So this Mid Mid Atlantic Ridge. The ridge moves. Right. Right. So with respect to the ridge, right? Because that's in in the in the earlier image, that's what sets up these uh, these temperature gradients. So, so, so these pressure gradients, right? So within here, you create flow that goes this way. So, you know, the references would be the ridge. I think you should see one. I think there's some work that's trying to constrain, um, you know, if, if this type of flow is, is something we can constrain by anisotropy. Um, but I don't, I don't think the, the verdict's out yet. Right, right, yes. Yes, it does. It does influence a little bit because um, the, the way these temperature gradients are set up. Also, if you look at the contribution from the, from the lateral pressure gradient, you can estimate on what the topography of the ridge should look like. And it's consistent with the observations we have and the difference between the Atlantic and the Pacific ridge systems. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you might be able to see that. Although, if you, if you then, yeah, you, you might be able to see that. Well, that's what I was thinking. Crayton's in the way, and it can't just flow that way. It's got a barrier. Right. Yeah. And, then, and then you come up with two different scenarios, right? It can either. I think people are beginning to work on this. Um, so what happens if you have this, this cratonic block and you, and you get a steam sphere pushing against it? Um, conceptually speaking, if your steam sphere ended here, that'd be one scenario. Or your steam sphere could extend below, and then you get probably more chan even more channelized flow underneath that might do um, funny things in terms of providing temperature to the base of the craton, or um, provide resistance or shearing at the base, um, or might drive it. You, you might get up one as well. So now we're talking. Yeah. But there was another question. Uh, what's, the, what's the driving pressure coming from? Where is the driving pressure coming from? The driving pressure? Yeah. Oh, so it's from these, from these temperature differences, basically. So you have, you have uh, right, so you have, you have cold material and warm material. And that sets up a temperature gradient, which sets up a pressure gradient, which drives flow in the steam sphere. Um, rich push is is not as big an effect. So slab pull is often. So so the answer would be where where slab pull exists, it's dominant. So so at, say the Pacific plate, even though you have this this uh, pressure driven flow, it doesn't matter because your your plate is so much so much faster being pulled. Now if you don't have this, then this can come into effect. Okay, so if you, so one of the one of the ways of describing. Um, so when is this important? You can't have a strong plate pulling. Um, you must have uh, you know, strong flow in here. You must have a short aspect ratio cell, a small, a a small plate, basically. Yeah. So if you have all that you have flow to, uh, away from the ridge, you must have a lot of uh, upwelling right underneath the ridge, right? To kind of compensate for the loss, the mass that leaves the system or not in the same way. I'm not quite sure. So if you're saying if you have a lot of flow that goes this way, you would expect things to change in here? No, but from below. From, from here? Basically, somewhere you have to kind of Right, yes, yes. So you have lots of upwelling, lots of catching, lots of production. Potentially. So why is the Atlantic so spreading? Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's not true. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a Right. Good question. Oh, no. Sucked in from, from outside of the melt, the melt zone. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm, as, uh, as I was saying, this is uh, white and black, so it's not all conclusive yet. <laughs> okay, I think I have a little bit more time. Um, okay, I have, I have two more things I want to I show you. Um, so from these simulations, what you can do is you can go one step further and say, if, if this is the case, so for, for different aspect ratios, here I plot surface heat flow. So how much heat do I get out of my fluid layer? And you see that for short aspect ratio cells, you get a trend that goes positive. So this is the case where I have this, this Poisson flow type. Um, but then for, for large aspect ratios that's associated with this uh, Coet flow type, I get a different trend. So what, what does that mean in terms of thermal evolution? Um, my first thought was, oh, this is great. I can plot not only the surface heat flux versus the aspect ratio. I can also see what the internal temperatures are for those cases and plot them up here. And then I see a trend that goes like this. Um, you know, this would, so this would be for the Poisson type, this would be for the Coet type. And then almost everybody agrees that back in the day, Earth was, Earth's mantle was hotter and it's cooling. So then time would go this way. So my thought was, how oh, great, I'll just go and use this as a, as a new way of prescribing how heat is lost based on internal temperature. And maybe that can solve a long-standing thermal history problem. And it turns out it can't, um, but that's good. So, so shown here in the dashed line is sort of a classical scaling mobile lead convection. Um, you start somewhere with, an, with a warm internal temperature or um, temperatures drop with time. Um, so you lose heat, this is heat loss, this temperature, you lose heat quickly, and then you come out with a value um, at the end of the day. And if you, con if you compare this value at the end of the day with the value, and this might be hard to see this, this very thin line, and that's the radio he radiogenic heating line, um, you, can, you can see, you can take the ratio at the end of the day, and that's what we call the present day Euro ratio. And we can estimate that from, from very different uh, methods, and then have to you know, take out radiogenics and the, and the continents and everything. But uh, the short story is we expect the value for the present day Euro ratio from convection to be somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5. So 0.6 is, is out, it's too high. Um, then, okay, so what about this sluggish lid idea where, where I limit the amount of heat loss in the, in the past? And that's great, I limit heat loss in the past, I come with a Euro ratio that's, that's appropriate, it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. The problem there is I limit heat loss so efficiently that I can't cool down my mantle and my mantle stays warm for, for long periods of time. And that seems unreasonable too. So that, that didn't work. And then I thought, well, what if on present day, we have both an Atlantic plate and a Pacific plate operating at the same time, losing heat at the same time. What if throughout Earth's history, we always had something like a Pacific plate and always something like an Atlantic plate operating at the same time? And so this would be a, a dual mode scaling where you use 50% Atlantic heat loss, 50% Pacific style heat loss, shown here for two different temperatures starting at either 1800 or 1500. And you see if you start warmer, you drop in temperature, you lose heat quickly in the beginning. If you start colder, you don't lose heat. You, you, you cool more slowly, so you don't lose heat as quickly. And you always kind of magically, in a way, end up with a U ratio of about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, which is great. So this is good. So these are two simulations. And, and maybe for, for people who are not in the business, um, those, those pretty colorful pictures are from large-scale direct numerical simulations. So we take the equations, the governing equations, discretize them in our model domain, and use computers um, to solve those, and then that can take any, any, anywhere from days to weeks um, on you know, a single core or maybe up to 100 or 1,000 cores. Um, these guys um, are run on a netbook and they take about a second or two. So there's no real reason to only use two. So my, my goal is to do 10,000 thermal evolutions. And shown here are the first 100 of them. Um, and, and what I do is I start with different co initial conditions in terms of initial temperature and different amounts of this. Uh, classic scaling, so this would be the classic mobile lid scaling, this would be the sluggish lid scaling, so this would be Atlantic, this is Pacific, oh, uh, Pacific only, Atlantic only, and then you know, someone here was, was the two lines I showed you before. Um, and then you constrain by color, so the outcome of the simulation is shown here in terms of present day temperature, color coded, so you, you end up warmer, you end up cooler, kind of makes sense. And you can do the same thing with a Euro ratio, you can do the same thing with core heat fluxes that we expect, and by by uh, then saying which, which fields are reasonable for, for today's values, I want to constrain the initial parameters of, of reasonable thermal evolutions. Um, but that's work in progress, and I, I just started about this a, a week ago. Um, so now let's, let's uh, swap, swap modes a, a bit. 
and uh, talk very specifically about this thickness of the asthenosphere, the thickness of the layer underneath the lithosphere, um, that is the low viscosity layer. And that I want to talk in terms about our two prime candidates, Earth and Venus. So we know the key, one of the key features of difference between the two planets is that, well, we live on this one and not the other one, that always works. Um, this one's plate tectonics, um, and you know, we, we can argue about if that's related. This one's plate tectonics, um, so we have a constant overturning of material, there's constant cooling, um, whereas Venus' surface doesn't seem to be constantly overturning. It seems that it might have episodic events happening every five or 700 million years or so. So wouldn't it be nice if I could explain the difference for just this, this little wiggle? Uh, I think it would be nice. Um, so let, let's see what would happen. So there's a, um, a simple theory, um, and you can write down what this, what this shear stress would look like. So basically, the velocity gradients and, and the viscosities at the base of the plate. And if you write that down, it looks a little bit more ugly if you do it in detail. But basically, this would be the, the predicted shear stress as a function of many things, including the Rayleigh number. Um, you have the stenosphere viscosity in here, the ratio of the stenosphere viscosity with the low mantle viscosity. This would be the aspect ratio. And here you have the low case D, which is the thickness of the stenosphere, non-dimensionalized by the, by the fluid layer depth. And you can see there's a sum in here. So this plus this. So you can think that there might be two end member limits in here. So let's assume for one that um, I'm looking at a very thin, thin uh, layer limit. So then this guy would be much smaller than this. And the scaling would go down that the predicted shear stress scales is something to the D of a minus one third. If you take the other end member limit, you come up with a scaling where the predicted shear stress scales to this uh, thickness times minus seven third. Well, that's all good. Um, if you then, then plot what this should look like, so shown here is uh, the predicted shear stress. So it's just basically plotting the equation so we get a feel on if this is reasonable in the, in the range of interest. So this channel thickness, predicted shear stress, you see a, a drop at minus one third, minus one third, minus one third, for different aspect ratios, minus seven thirds. And you can plot this for different viscosities and sort of get a feel on if this is, is reasonable. Is D the box size or is D the top layer? D is the top layer. So if this is, if this is the entire mantle, then D is really the thickness of the asthenosphere. There's lowercase d and this is uppercase d. And what kind of mechanical assumptions do you make on the top layer? Given the fact that Venus uh, is so warm that presumably the brittle vector boundary is above the surface uh, if you assume similar compositional properties. Right. So the place would have very low strength. Right. That's, uh, I don't make those assumptions. I don't make any assumptions. I basically stay, stay at a very simplified model. And uh, part of where we're trying to start is with the simplest model possible and see if I can explain things. And if not, then step up the level of complexity. Another question? OK. Um, so Venus and Earth are usually referred to as twin planets. They're, they're very similar in radius composition, distance from the sun. And yet they show these two different styles of tectonics. And the common assumption has been in the community that that's probably due to the fact that Earth's yield stress is somewhat lower than the one on Venus. And it might be due to the hydrous weakening effect of water. We have surface water on Earth. We don't have surface water on Venus. Um, so my take is maybe we'll look at the convective shear stress, and maybe that changes if I change between Earth style, where I have a thin layer of low viscosity, where this viscosity contrast is maybe significant, compared to a Venus-like planet that doesn't have a stenosphere, and so you're, you're left with an upper mantle that is slightly less viscous than a lower mantle. So I'm testing these predictions using a three-dimensional spherical shell mantle convection model, SITCOM S, which is the CRG's flagship at the moment, with these stratified viscosities. And on top of that, I use temperature and yield, yield stress-dependent rheology, which is um, sort of the state of the art these days for, for self-consistently generating plates in mantle convection models. So here's a reference case uh, without the asthenosphere. Um, and let me introduce what these, what these uh, images show. So this is a slice through the temperature field. You see downwellings. Um, and you see sort of ridge-like features at various spots. And so there's the cold surface and the warm interior. These are two isosurfaces, warm and cold. And they'll come on much more clear in the next image, on the next slide. This is surface velocities, dark blue indicate zero, no surface velocity. And then warmer, temp warmer colors indicate uh, higher velocities. 
And these guys are patches of high viscosity. So they're the best way of describing plates in a way that I can think of. So these, these guys are moving coherently as one unit. And outlined in yellow are the zones where plastic yielding occurs. Shown on the bottom of the slide are profiles. So this is depth of the fluid layer. Um, profiles of temperature, log viscosity, and azimuthal velocity. And azimuthal is basically um, the horizontal version of, of when you're in the sphere. So it's horizontal velocity for practical purposes. Shown in the thin dashed line is this uh, reference case with an asthenosphere. So you still see the drop in temperature, the thermal boundary layer. You see more constant values here, another thermal boundary layer. You see the viscosity is strongly temperature dependent. So we have a very strong viscosity at the surface, high viscosity here, temperatures are low, and some reduction towards where it's warmer, and then um, increase with depth. And you see velocities, surface velocities are there. Things are moving on the surface. Um, but they're not significantly different from velocities in the interior in terms of order of magnitude. If you then throw in a stenosphere or a thin layer of low viscosity, um, shown here, two, two different cases where this viscosity notch is 1 over 30 or 1 over 100. Um, so you still see the strong plate. You see a low viscosity stenosphere region and then the lower mantle. First thing you notice is that the internal temperatures reduce significantly. So this shows that there's more effective cooling. Um, I can reduce the temperature in the interior. In the, in the images here, you see that we've now moved from the, from the earlier state to, to a system where we have one hemisphere of upwelling. So these are upwelling regions. These are downwelling regions. Um, surface velocities have picked up, and, and plates are moving about from the divergent hemisphere to the convergent hemisphere. Um, so surface velocities have increased, and most of the strain is, 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 is uh, accumulated here in this low viscosity region. This is what it should look like. Um, in an animation, these are the same images, just organized a little differently to fit on the screen better. And this is what it looks like in animation. So you have hot material that's welling up, material flowing back this way, coming down here. And you see that this is a, what we call a statistically sta stable pattern. Um, while not every image of every time step looks the same, there's no fundamental difference um, in average properties over long times. So and you see how material is moving at the surface. Um, plates are created and then move downwards to be absorbed again. Um, all of these runs are both internally heated and heated from below. And one of the interesting things here is that even though I apply the same amount of basal heating, basal uh, surface cooling and internal heating, the resulting in temperature is not the same. And it, it, it's a dynamic quantity that depends on the style of convection, the pattern, the topography of the pattern. In a way, it does. Um, in a way, it does. One of the things that's important if you think about temperature and viscosities and, and, and what's driving your plates, in terms of internal temperature, it's very important if you have, and, and maybe I should have introduced this earlier <clears throat> a little bit more, if you have a mantle that's very hot compared to a mantle that's colder. So that in the hot mantle, you have a strong contrast with the surface, which is cold, not so much a, a contrast with, with the core. So you would expect your your boundary layer instabilities from the surface to be dominant, and that with the classical slab-driven convection cell. Whereas in the world where, where the interior is very cold, you have rather equal amounts of, of, um, of gradients between temperature at the surface and, and at the top and the, and the top and the bottom. And so we expect that you know, plume-like features will have a significant control as well. Um, so there, it's important if you really want to model the Earth, and I don't think anybody can really model the Earth. We only can model things that are kind of, in a way, hopefully similar to Earth's. Um, then you would want to go for, for a system that's mostly internally heated and stays very warm. But if you run into this convective, like the one I showed before, the reference case was very warm in the interior, right? So your plumes aren't very strong, the, the slabs are. But if you just throw in the asthenosphere, and I didn't change anything else, internal temperature changes. And I'm not saying this does. This doesn't have continents and other complications, but I'm, I'm trying to get at the basics. You had a question? Yeah, so why does, uh, why are the upwellings and the downwellings, uh, you're kind of changing mode of convection by just adding the essence? Right. That's one of the surprising features. And that, that goes along with the Cartesian stuff I've done before, where if you add the low viscosity zone, you're suddenly able to drive much longer convection cells. And, and what happens is that if you want to drive lateral flow, it's very convenient having a zone where 
dissipation is minimized, we don't absorb so much energy. And since, since this degree, this, this pattern is the largest aspect ratio you can have in a, in a sphere, that's where, that's where you go. Right, yes, yes. Right, you're right. This is something we do akin to what seismologists do, where they only show differences from what you expect. So this is taking the adiabatic gradient out. Yeah. So, so your, maybe this is related to what Alan was just asking. In your model with the steam sphere, you have a lower temperature in your steam sphere than because I guess you have more rapid cooling. But your, does your viscosity actually evolve to increase because of that lower temperature? Right, yeah, um, that's a very good question. So here, are the two cases here are for vis viscosity changes, so in this. In this notch, so, so this value is either 1 over 30 or 1 over 100 for, for those lines. Um, so they should be different by about a factor of 3, um, and yet they're not. And there's, there's a feedback mechanism. So there's, you know, if, if you just plot the reference viscosity that I apply, this line would be out here. But because the temperatures are high, are lower, viscosities are higher, and that, that move this guy back out here. But they're still a lot lower than the harder Venus model. Oh, I haven't shown you the Venus model yet. I've showed you the, well, the, the, the reference model. Yes, yes, they are. Um, because I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, right, right. So. Right, so the, the, way, the way I'm doing this is, um, so there's the reference viscosity and then there's the exponential with the, with the temperature dependence, right? So this guy is basically the step function. So I prescribe in the sphere that everything else being the same, viscosity should be lower. And that's, that's basically following the dehydration model where you would expect plates to be stronger and the sphere to be weaker. And on top of that, I use the temperature dependence, yes. So then if you increase the thickness of the low viscosity layer, you end up in a system that can look like this. So this is a one plate planet without surface velocities. And if you look at the slice through the temperature, you see the very thick lithosphere. You see convection is limited to the region below. The surface does not partake. And you can see sort of in this um, ISO surfaces, you see the spatial extent of these convection cells. If you look at the temperature profile, you see a conductive lid, and then there's the dashed line, um, and then no, it's the solid line, sorry. Um, conductive lid, and then a, a very warm interior. If you look at horizontal velocities, you see there's no surface motion, and, and convection motion is limited to the region below that has relatively low viscosity. Now, this is not, uh, uh, I can show you, I think. Yes, this is what it looks like animated. So you see that the the one plate planet stays intact and the surface doesn't, doesn't change and all motion is confined to the region underneath. If you hit the parameters just right, you can also get something that we call episodic convection. And what happens here is you have very long times of this technolid behavior where convection occurs underneath this lid. And then at certain times, basically all hell breaks loose and you start subducting much of the surface to the core metal boundary, changing things fundamentally. And shown the, here is a, is a snapshot on a time step that's, that's during this um, catastrophic resurfacing event where you have lots of subduction zones, lots of things going down, cooling effectively the core metal boundary. And you can see this here in the dashed line where you cool the interior um, sufficiently. Your surface velocities are picked up quite significantly um, compared to the stagnant mode. And so if you see localized surface velocities are increasing, you see your, your surface plate is, is disappearing. Um, there's lots of deformation, and there should be an animation that follows this. We can look at that a little bit. So here you see nothing happening. There we go. So you see um, instability is developing and your plate disappearing. But breaking up in many regions, surface velocities mimic this as well. And you see subduction occurring, um, cold material spreading at the core mental boundary. Um, eventually, all of your surface will be re replaced by new material. And so you're cooling the system so much that you can hold much of the regular thermal convection for a bit that it gives, gives time to replace um, the, the surface again with a cold conductive lid. What's the time scale for the resurfacing? Um, that is model dependent. And I'm, I'm working on 
on trying to figure that out. If you look at, it's actually a good question. Um, the short answer is we don't know this yet. But if you look at the surface heat flux for these different cases, this is the mobile lit case, um, surface heat flux versus time. So here we have a value between 17 and 18, um, wiggling around a very well defined mean. Stagnant lit convection, you have a much lower value, maybe 12 to 13, and it's basically a flat line. And this is the episodic convection. So you have these long periods where nothing happens, and then these episodic outbursts. And I would say at the moment, we don't understand what sets this timing, and we also don't understand what sets the timing within this uh, overturning event. But um, if you, I've done a few of these now, changing the thickness of this low viscosity layer and its viscosity, and it seems to be sensitive to those values significantly, to the extent that if I were to, and technically I should be writing this with the white pen on black, uh, but if I were to plot the period of these events over some quantity that's related to thickness and viscosity, um, you see something that goes like this. Um, so period, a low period, say a period of zero, would be constant overturning, and that'd be mobile lit convection. And this would be about infinity. That means there's no overturning, so that'd be this technical end member. And so then you can argue where you want to find your episodic region. But my point being is that if you do en enough of these simulations, you see that it's not clear that we necessarily have very strict regime boundaries, but it might be sort of going into more gradually changing from one to the other. And interestingly, this would probably be where you will reach maybe, I don't know, maybe two billion years, where you get into the time scale of secular cooling. And so even if you would try to, try to um, get an episodic resurfacing event going after two or three billion years, you know, you, you lost the heat to do that. So that's probably where you would have set the transition to stagnant behavior. Good question. I'm using a radius approximation. Yeah. Approximation. Oh, the, the, you know, where in the exponent and non dimensionalized, you go e over t, e over 2 or something. Right? So it's an arena. Yeah. 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 You're not using that. No. So it's hard to develop long term resurfaces Over long terms, probably, yeah. <laughs> People have argued that in Earth's history might be something where we transition from this regime early on, maybe to this regime. And I'd, I'd like to emphasize that all of these runs don't have continents imposed or continents in there. That's something I'm working on right now. And they would fundamentally not only change the, the flow pattern where, you know, of continents, you will have hindering effects to the stenosphere and maybe stiffer things around on the surface, but you would also change, change the internal temperature and the dynamics there. So that's, that's for the future, yeah. But there, there's, there's papers out there that, that think that maybe Earth wasn't always in this or a similar regime, but maybe stepped from here into something like this. Yeah. So finally, if you then plot the, and I'm, I'm about to close up here, if you then plot the channel thickness against the computed shear stress, and since it is a numerical model, I have the information at all points available. So I can figure out at each of these uh, points, where's the base of the plate, What's the, shear, what's the velocity gradient, what's the viscosity, I can compute the shear stress, and I can uh, sum them all up. And if I do that, plot the reference case, um, and maybe I should, so the reference case would be for, for a thickness of one half, right, your flow going this way. So your shear scale would be one half of this thickness. Um, and then if you put the stenosphere in, or you make it thinner, then you know, this becomes smaller than one half. Um, so the reference case is one half. If you put a stenosphere in, you already see an increase, an increase in shear stress here. And then if you further decrease the thickness of the asthenosphere, you see a further increase. And interestingly, this increase here, if you look at you know, the amount of this, it scales somewhere in between this minus one third and minus seven third that I introduced earlier. So this suggests that the simple scaling arguments from before give us an insight on what's happening in those complex simulations. You can also plot a regime diagram. So this again would be channel thickness versus the applied yield stress. 
And what many people have found is that if you go, if your yield stress is sufficiently high, so if you make it hard for your plates to break, you get into a stagnant lid mode. But it turns out if you then introduce the lowest cost use zone, um, you can always go mobile if you want to. Likewise, if you're in a low yield stress situation, you'll find mobile lid convections, the, the uh, yellow dots. But then if you increase that shear zone again, the, sh the shear scale, you can go episodic and you can get stagnant lid convection. And if you were to look at where our reference planets would fall, so Venus would fall somewhere in terms of channel thickness somewhere around here where you find maybe a stagnant or episodic convection. And Earth would fall all the way over here at thinnest thinner spheres uh, where you'd most likely expect mobile lid convection. So what, I'm, what I've been trying to show you is that the, the shear scale, the low viscosity zone underneath the lithospheric plate is an important constraint on the planetary, planetary style of tectonics. Um, it doesn't, and, and why? Because it increased the stress scale and the convective stresses. And this doesn't mean that other mechanisms are not at work, for example, um, hydro's weakening, but they're not necessary at this point. I arrived at the conclusions. So um, I talked about viscous coupling at the lithosphere student sphere boundary. Um, and ideally, I would expect this image to show up again with the Pacific and the Atlantic and the different flow profiles. Um, I've talked about that this thickness and the viscosity of this layer has first order control on mental dynamics and on the tectonic style of a terrestrial planet. And that quantitatively, we can use predictions from simple theory and scaling arguments to predict the increase in shear stress. Um, and that might help increasing the the yield stress of your planet. And so that plate tectonics is possible at even at high yield stresses without the additional need for weakening mechanism. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for questions. Why do you see a sphere boundary that seismologists see in the actual interface of all Why? That's a good question. Um, and the, the short answer is I don't know. But it, it, it's one of those questions that, that would link you to what is the eosinosphere and what makes the eosinosphere different from the lithosphere. And if you go to the, to the general half space cooling model where all of your temperature, um, all your temperature gradients or temperature isosurfaces um, sort of decay over time and descend, then you wouldn't, ex wouldn't expect anything different. Um, now, that all assumes there's no, no, no material parameter that changes. There's no melt involved. There's no dehydration at the ridges involved. There's no um, partial melt possible. There's no phase change anywhere. Um, so all those things come into play and make things more complicated. Um, but yeah, it'd be great if we could figure out what this seems to be really is. Yeah. Yes. And so that you still, so that because the, the temperature gradient beneath that would be pretty small until old ages. And so a lot of your pressure gradient will be in a higher viscosity lid, which might make that flow more sluggish. Mm -hmm. um. But you, so you have that step in there? Yes, in, in all of the models I've shown you, I have this, this viscosity jump in there, yeah. In the, Cartesian, in the Cartesian models, I only have this viscosity jump in there. So there's no added temperature um, dependence on viscosity. So all the C Cartesian cases where I showed you the flow profiles, they just have an, isovis an isoviscous uh, material with a step function. It looked like in your cartoon yeah. that you had the lithosphere seems to boundary as an isotherm. In the Cartesian models? In your first, I think, it was, I mean, in your slide, okay. it was one of your first black slides. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes, in my black slides, okay. And so you had your, your, your... Right, yes, yes. So that, so that, I was wondering if, if you made that boundary flat mm -hmm. until you could get over ages, whether you would inhibit... The right, yes, line. yes, now, now I understand what you're saying, yes. In the, in the initial side, that's just a... Yes, um, so the, the models were like this, and then I tried to explain it um, with this simple theory. And it, it's, it's correct. In those cases, I assume that the boundary is basically a temperature uh, boundary, which then can be mimicked into a mechanical rheological boundary. Um, there, I did not include this step function, though. No.
Um, I don't know if the, is the, is the honest answer. How much would you, how much would you need to uplift the Andes? It's pushing and pushing in Brazilian shield. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, the estimations, I've, the estimate I've done is about, I think, two or three megapascal. Um, I can remember that's enough to, to drive the Andes. You have a question? Yeah, I think you covered it briefly, but what's the implication for the onset of small scale convection when you have uh, this massive shear flow underneath the base of the lithosphere? Is it suppress that instability from happening and you know the, as far as the uh, the flattening of the you know, seafloor and the or the lithosphere at a certain age. Right. Well I could see how it that gets back to your scaling. Yeah, yeah. I haven't looked at that yet, um, but that's an interesting question. It's an interesting thing to look at. So the question is if you have um, if you A have space on your board So if you have your um, half space cooling model and then you see the small scale convection that provides perturbations to your lithosphere boundary, would that change in the picture of having strong um, flow in the asthenosphere? And the answer is probably would. Now we're seeing these things in the, in the Pacific where I wouldn't expect the, the very strong flow. But an interesting problem to you know, trying to figure out quantitatively um, how, how this would change. One of the things I know that does change if you have strong flow here, it, it, what you do is you're providing a lot of he excess heat even far into the region. So that might also help keeping this, this gradient up without having an onset of um, small scale convection. Is that reflected in the thermal history scaling that you use for heat flow? And, um... no, 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 I don't have any small scale in there. Right, yeah, yeah. So I, I use the, the shear wave velocity and it usually, um, you, know, you can find either the, the model from Priestley, or something like this, and then he has basically different velocities at different ages and so you map the age into distance and you get a, a gradient. Um, or the ones from, from Jim Garrity, they come as profiles um, for, for different ages and then you take, again, the values and, and map those, and you know, assuming that everything is driven by temperature differences. Right? Good. Right. Um, good question. I I don't. I'm not aware that people have quantified this. Um, now, now all of this comes out of sort of a scaling argument, right? Um, but if you, I don't know how you would constrain the observations. What the, what the shear magnitude would be. But I, I guess from the numbers I have, I can compute what the shear stress should be and see if that makes sense in terms of breaking rocks or producing seismicity. Very interesting constraint to look at. Getting back to this, there must be a minimum viscosity that, that, would, make, that would make it prohibitive that the velocity gradients would be too high. Like, for example, if the viscosity had, as some people would argue, some partial melt, mm -hmm. and that drives a, a small layer of, of um, the mantle underneath the lithosphere, you know, like the, the weakest part of the asthenosphere would be really weak, just just a very small amount because of the presence of partial mm -hmm. melt. Would, would there be a, a viscosity that this would just couple the system entirely? Yeah, you can think of end members sort of in terms of what happens if your viscosity goes to zero. Right, if say you don't have mental rock anymore, you have water in there or something. Um, but then at the same time, you would expect your velocities to pick up, and, and if you get into supersonic velocities, you're probably out of the ballpark um, <laughs> that we would expect. Um, at the same time, you can. Well, just be decoupled, right? right, yeah. If you close be decoupled, there wouldn't be a velocity gradient, but it would be separated. You would always have a velocity gradient. It could be. You will always have a velocity gradient. It might be on a, on a very, very thin. 
Um, maybe that's what you're asking. Um, so if this is your, your boundary and you create this very thin zone, you will always have, I mean, material has to, has to move, right, continuously, um, at least in the, in the continuum uh, approach, right? So you can have this very narrow, and then if you, if you look at it with a bare eye, you would say it's discontinuous, right? Um, but that goes into what's the, you know, what's this thickness? And, this, and you, can, you can look at that, but it turns out that the, the background theory that I'm using um, you know, has inherently has a limit of applicability where this thickness can't be much, you know, can't be much lower than sort of the thickness of the boundary layer. Right. So but it's, it's assuming, it's a, sorry, it's assuming that, you know, everything that moves up has to go laterally. And so if it, if it all goes, if it all goes laterally and in the stenosphere, right, then you have to have the um, constraint by, by continuous flow that you need to have that at a certain thickness. To turn my question around, you can use this to infer what the minimum viscosity in the sphere would be. Right. And then, there, and then maybe rule out yes. whether there's a large presence of minimum. Right, yes. And if you're lucky, you can even back out if there could be water or not, or carbon. Yeah. Right. So you can have two uh, separate systems. Oh, yes, that's true. But, you know, again, the, the equations I'm using are, are very simple. They don't include partial melt at all. Yeah. yeah. I think we're just speculating on what you potentially could do with this. 